Hey guys, welcome back. In this video, I'm going to be showing you proof of an artificial nervous system. Now this artificial nervous system is also known as Morgellons disease. With Morgellons disease, people complain of little fibers sticking out of their skin and uh, that it's itchy and it irritates them. And I'm gonna show you pictures of these fibers. I'm gonna explain it all to you. Now this is all connected to nano, the fourth industrial revolution, V2K, Voice the Skull, and electronic harassment, which is really not harassment, it's actually uh, electronic torture. Okay guys, so let's take a look at these uh, pictures and uh, I'm gonna comment on the pictures. Okay guys, here's the first picture. And in this picture here, you can see uh, what look like a bunch of fibers. Now, I got this picture from Google when I typed in Morgellons disease. And people who get Morgellons disease, they get these little fibers sticking out of their skin and it uh, irritates them. Now what these fibers are, this is the artificial nervous system that's controllable with frequencies poking out of their skin. But um, when people go complain about this to doctors and they show them the fibers, the, uh, the doctors or whoever, you know, the powers that be, they say, oh no, those aren't wires just sticking out of your skin or whatever. They say, oh, you're, you're delusional. They say you're, uh, you know, you have a mental illness or it's mass hysteria. Here's another picture of these uh, Morgellons fibers, which are really just uh, nano, which they put in the food and drinks. And basically, they're like a bunch of wires like, you know, our nervous system is, uh, you know, like fleshy wires, I guess you could say. But these are uh, wires that were created by the military. Like, you know, nano, extremely tiny wires, which are controllable with frequencies. And this is uh, how they do V2K on people, voice the skull. And this is how they shock people and zap people and manipulate their nervous system remotely with frequencies from uh, signals intelligence bases and satellites. Okay, next picture. Okay, in this picture you can see um, these are actual nano uh, fibers in someone's skin. You can see this is a, a close-up of somebody's skin. You can actually see their pores in this. And then you see these, this, uh, you see these blue Morgellon fibers in their skin. Now these fibers, um, you know, I don't know if they want, if the, the designers of these fibers wanted these fibers to you know, go to the skin, but that could just be a side effect that they didn't intend. And then uh, this causes irritation to the skin. Then the person goes to the doctor and starts complaining about these fibers coming out of their skin. And because they don't want people to understand that they've put an artificial nervous system in everybody to spy on everyone, then they, they, uh, they use the cover story saying that the person's delusional and crazy. Uh, so nobody will believe what they say. Next photo. Now you can look at this man's chin here and his neck. And you can see how he has these lesions on his cheek and he has these uh, raw lesions under his neck. Now this is from uh, the Morgellons nanofibers. They poke through the skin and then they cause this irritation. Now I'm sure the designers didn't, uh, you know, intend on this effect, but this is effect that's having, and they're probably doing a lot of uh, research and study on this to try to get this to not happen. But, um, People go to the doctor about this and they show them the fiber sticking out and they complain about it. I'm, sh I'm sure these lesions on his neck are really uh, irritating him and bothering him. Here's another close-up of uh, a little lesion on the skin. Now my brother had a lesion like this on his, his leg, on his shin, and he, it looked that lesion would not heal for a whole complete 12 months, a whole year. And uh, so what I did, I took a shocker like a stun gun and I put it on the spot and then I shocked him in that spot and then within two weeks it was gone it totally healed it so whatever uh, was there the only reason it was healed is because a massive amount of electricity went through it all of a sudden if nano is an artificial nervous system then uh, a large shock like that that could um, overload the circuitry and destroy the circuit now here's another uh, picture of some nano, some uh, blue blue uh, fibers. It says right here that these are a fiber bundle from a lesion. They're uh, white and blue, and there's also red fibers. So yeah, there's mostly blue fibers here, and then there's uh, some white fibers and one red fiber. 
And this came out of somebody's, uh, a lesion on, out of someone's skin. Now this obviously isn't normal to come out of someone's skin. This is um, an artificial nervous system and it's based on artificial intelligence. And this is um, remotely controllable with frequencies. So they can use this to uh, remotely monitor people's thoughts and brains and uh, their central nervous system and their secondary nervous system. Now your central nervous system consists of your brain and your spine. And then all the little nerves that come off your spine, that's your secondary nervous system. Also, uh, your eyes. Your eyes are part of your uh, primary nervous system. Okay, here's another close-up of some of these uh, Morgellons fibers. And they're all white. And they sort of, uh, you know, they remind me of what hair would look like on a close-up. Here's another one. A big ball of these nanofibers that come out of people's skin who, who uh, they think they have more gallons. Here's another close-up of some fibers. You have some uh, mostly red fibers here and some yellow fibers, a few white fibers. Now, I don't know what the different colors signify, but um, I don't know. Maybe in the future we'll find that out. Some more of these more gallons fibers. And you can see... Uh, Blue, purple, and, and what looks like clear fibers. Also uh, a little bit of green in there. Now, one thing I will say, years ago, I seen these types of fibers for myself with my very own eyes in McDonald's chicken nuggets. I seen blue fibers that look just like this in McDonald's chicken nuggets. And uh, you could actually look up videos on YouTube and uh, you, could type, you could type in uh, fibers in McDonald's chicken nuggets or something like that or maybe uh, more gallons fibers in McDonald's chicken nuggets This is Mike Adams, the Health Ranger with NaturalNews.com. I'm the same guy that brought you the story about the fake blueberries in blueberry muffins and blueberry cereals. Well, today we're going to take a closer look at what's in your McDonald's food. I'm standing in the parking lot of a McDonald's restaurant in Austin, Texas, and we're going to order some chicken McNuggets and a Big Mac and put it under a high-powered microscope to take a really close look at what's in your food. I'll take some chicken McNuggets and um, a Big Mac. And is that the only size McNuggets you have? We got the 20. Oh, uh, no, I don't, I don't think I can handle 20. Well, that's the okay. biggest. I guess 10 is, is enough. All right, we made it home, and now we're going to check out the chicken McNuggets with some safety gloves. These are the nuggets right here. You've seen these before because there are only three basic shapes. That right there is kind of scary. But now we're going to put them under the high-powered digital microscope and check out what's really inside Chicken McNuggets. We began our investigation by looking at the surface of the Chicken McNuggets, then zooming in to get more detail. At high magnification, we began to notice mysterious fibers across the surface, as well as some unusual color, such as this red color which appears to be some sort of food coloring agent we decided to dig deeper by opening the chicken mcnugget to find out what was inside there we began to see shapes reminiscent of an alien landscape nothing resembled chicken in my mind Watch as we zoom in on this image. Never seen chicken look transparent. With the help of the high-tech digital microscope at the Natural News Forensic Food Labs, we were able to alter the plane of observation even at high magnification so we can see the texture of this chicken McNugget landscape. looked, 
the more seemingly strange things we began to discover across these chicken McNuggets, including strange blue objects with fibers. We also found dark looking splotches and weird shapes that raised questions. But by far the strangest things we found were unexplained fibers that appear to resemble hairs. All the hair-like fibers we found seem to be embedded in the mass of the McNugget. Here's another one with odd endings. And here's a third found next to some mysterious red coloring. These fibers intrigued me so much that I attempted to remove one of them. This is me using a pair of fine tweezers to try to remove this one embedded hair-like fiber. Here are some of the other scenes of what we found inside the Chicken McNuggets. We also located a green spherical object that actually looks like algae. Nowhere did we find anything that really looked like chicken. Here's what chicken looks like. We acquired this at a local Mexican restaurant that used real chicken, not processed chicken. Back to the Chicken McNugget. My advice is to look more closely at what you eat before you eat it and ask questions about where your food really comes from and what's in it. You may be shocked to find you're eating far more than you bargained for. Here's the Illuminati card game entitled Fast Food Chains, and it says, Would you like fries with that? Give plus six on any attempt to destroy a green group. And then again it says, Would you like fries with that? A second time. And it says, Nobody has any idea what's in those secret recipes, and when they find out, they forget again. Order the fries, Earthling. Now, as we've seen from the video we just watched right before this, Mike Adams clearly showed that there's nano in the chicken nuggets at uh, McDonald's. So this uh, Illuminati card game, fast food chains card, maybe it's, um, let me see here. Oh, look at that. When you zoom into this Illuminati card game card, and you look at the burger, it shows worms. Wow. It shows worms in the burger and in the bun. I've never seen that before until I zoomed into it closely. So yeah, maybe stick to the fries. Because in this picture, the burger has worms. Now, here are some close-ups of some lesions on people's skin. And you'll see on the left-hand side here, you'll see uh, this guy has five or six lesions on his hand. And that's all where the nano is breaking out of his skin and uh, causing this irritation. And you'll see on the right-hand side, this person here has lesions all over their buttocks and lower back. And I'm sure that's very uh, irritating and painful. The people who have come up with this nano design, I'm sure they're trying to work on uh, getting the nano to not pop out of the skin like this. So when these people go and complain about this, um, about these lesions on their skin, about the fibers sticking out of their skin, these doctors who are in secret societies, they say, oh, no, you're just imagining it. You're delusional. You're crazy. It's, a, it's a, the perfect cover story. Because you can say anybody's crazy without any evidence at all. Because it's, it's just a stupid opinion. Here's another uh, extreme close-up of somebody's skin. And you can see, see the little fibers growing through their skin. That's the, it's the, uh, the nano. Now here's a really good uh, close-up of the nano. You can really see the fibers here coming out of the skin. And they're all black fibers. And uh, to me... It looks uh, similar to a really thin thread, but um, obviously you could, uh, you could understand how some sort of electrical impulse could go down these fibers the same way as uh, any wire or, you know, part of your nervous system. Here's another extreme close-up of this stuff in the skin. This is the artificial nervous system popping out of the skin. If you want to see proof of the artificial nervous system, here it is. It's right in front of your face. Somebody wrote a little booklet or pamphlet here called Morgellons Disease, A Crime of Silence. 
Now, the reason that they're silent on this is because this is a um, top-secret military operation to secretly spy on all the public without them knowing with frequencies. So that's why um, these people with more gallons, that's why they're not getting anywhere with uh, a cure because it's not an actual disease. It's, um, it's an experiment by the military. Now you can see this person has all these lesions over their, their shin. And you can see how uh, one of those lesions, they circled it with ink. And um, my brother had a, had a lesion on his shin as well, sort of similar to one of these. And uh, it just would not heal for over a year until I zapped it. I zapped it with a, a stun gun and then it healed. Isn't that interesting? You ever heard of that before? Another close-up of the Morgellons fibers. You have white fibers, blue fibers, green fibers. And here's another look at uh, somebody's legs, their shins. And they have lesions all over both shins from these Morgellons fibers popping out of the skin. Now here's a really good close-up of somebody's uh, skin. And you can see all these little fibers popping out of the skin. And they look just like uh, really tiny threads or hairs, but uh, they're all white. And uh, this is how they created this artificial nervous system and remote neural monitoring and V2K and electronic harassment. It's all because of these wires, frequencies, and satellites and uh, signals intelligence bases. Now here's a guy's hand. Um, it look, you know, he has a lot of wounds on his hand here, a lot of lesions, and that looks extremely painful and uncomfortable. And you can see a close-up uh, of some of those wounds there in the bottom picture, and you can see all those fibers in the wounds, all those uh, nanofibers. I'm not sure exactly what this is, but I think, I think these here are samples of people's skin who complained about more gallons. Here's another close-up of a bunch of those, uh, Morgellons fibers coming out of the skin. I'm not sure what this is. This looks like it's uh, been taken under a microscope. Maybe they could be red blood cells and, uh, and then they're surrounded by nano. Now here's a look at what they call smart dust. Now smart dust, um, it's basically a little computer chip that was made by Hitachi. It's uh, Hitachi's GPS enabled smart dust chip. And it says here, sometimes called smart dust, as they can be sprayed on us and absorbed or taken in foods, drink, and even injected. And you can see on the tip of this guy's finger how tiny that is. It looks like it's the size of uh, a little flake of pepper. And here's an even closer look of the smart dust on the tip of his finger. And uh, you can tell, I mean, you could put that in people's food really easy and they would have no clue they're eating it. And then they have uh, microchips inside them and they're not aware of it. Here you see the human hair, and then you have uh, all the smart dust surrounding it. So this smart dust is, uh, it's extremely small. It's microscopic. And this here is like an artist uh, rendering of smart dust being blown through the air. You know, maybe that's what they're doing with uh, chemtrails. So I heard about smart dust, um, you know, quite a few years ago now. But, uh, yeah, I don't, I don't really hear people talking about it anymore. It's like the, the subject has already been discussed and people forgot about it or something. Smart dust, they could spray that everywhere over the planet. And then basically uh, the smart dust is a little detecting device. And uh, they could give an artificial nervous system to the whole planet if they just spray the smart dust all over the planet and they could detect everything anywhere on Earth. Little uh, microscopic nano robot looking like it's uh, taking a chunk out of a piece of DNA and uh, it looks like something straight out of a sci-fi movie. But, um, you know, it's obviously possible for them to make something this small because all you have to do is look at uh, the size of an ant. And, you know, the, an ant has a nervous system and a brain, and they're extremely tiny. And you can go tinier than that. You could look at viruses, and you could look at uh, bacteria. And they have... Uh, very small microscopic uh, structures that and they're alive so um, if those living things are that tiny and they work then I'm sure um, the most intelligent scientists in the military and the government I'm sure they could all work together 
and create uh, technology that is as small as an ant or as or is as small as bacteria or a virus and then and then they could uh, put this technology inside of humans and that's it for the pictures next I'm going to show you guys some videos of uh, prominent people speaking about transhumanism. And first up is Charles Schwab from the World Economic Forum. One of the features of this fourth industrial revolution is that it doesn't change what we are doing, but it changes us. The difference of this fourth uh, industrial revolution is it doesn't change what you are doing. It changes you if you take a genetic editing. Right. Uh, just as an example, it's you who it's are changed, yeah, and of yeah. course this has a big impact on yeah. your identity. Yeah. And offers certain kinds of possibilities that have to be careful about. You yeah. know, when you, began to, when you began to do that kind of gene editing, some people worry that you were changing what it means to be human. It's, that's the problem. And, yeah. uh, it, uh, of course, the new uh, Industrial Revolution offers us many opportunities, but it raises many fold questions on the ethical but even legal uh, implications and we have to be prepared for it and that's what we want to do in Davos next year. Talk about technology and how the ways it can be deployed uh, you know that contribute to growth rather than exacerbate unemployment how will that implement itself? It's a big question mark because uh, there is a fear that uh, technology, robots, uh, just to take yeah. one yeah. You get element. You get from machines. Exactly. And it replaces maybe um, the workforce or jobs faster than we can replace them with the new jobs. So, uh, not everybody can be a robot polisher and so yes. on. So yes. there will be new jobs. Many tyrants and governments wanted to do it, but nobody understood biology well enough. And nobody had enough computing power and data to hack millions of people. Neither the Gestapo nor the KGB could do it. But soon, at least some corporations and governments will be able to systematically hack all the people. We humans should get used to the idea that we are no longer mysterious souls. We are now hackable animals. Data might enable human elites to do something even more radical than just build digital dictatorships. By hacking organisms, elites may gain the power to re-engineer the future of life itself. Because once you can hack something, you can usually also engineer it. And if indeed we succeed, in hacking and engineering life, this will be not just the greatest revolution in the history of humanity. This will be the greatest revolution in biology since the very beginning of life four billion years ago. For four billion years, nothing fundamental changed in the basic rules of the game of life. All of life for four billion years dinosaurs, amoebas, tomatoes, humans, all of life was subject to the laws of natural selection and to the laws of organic biochemistry. But this is now about to change. Science is replacing evolution by natural selection with evolution by intelligent design. Not the intelligent design of some god above the clouds. But our intelligent design and the intelligent design of our clouds, the IBM cloud, the Microsoft cloud, these are the new driving forces of evolution. And at the same time, science may enable life after being confined to, for four billion years to the limited realm of organic compounds, science may ena enable life to break out into the inorganic realm. So after four billion years of organic life shaped by natural selection, we are entering the era of inorganic life shaped by intelligent design. So does the data about my DNA, my brain, my body, my life, does it belong to me or to some corporation 
or to the government or perhaps to the human collective. Humans are now hackable animals. You know, the, the whole idea that humans have, you know, this, they, they have this soul or spirit and they have free will and nobody knows what's happening inside me. So whatever I choose, whether in the election or whether in the supermarket, this is my free will, that's over. Free will, that's over. That's over. Over. Today, we have the technology to hack human beings on a massive scale. Yeah, I mean, everything is being digitalized. Everything is being monitored. In this time of crisis, you have to follow science. It's often said that you should never allow a good crisis to go to waste because a crisis is an opportunity to also do re good reforms that in normal times people will never agree to. But in a crisis, you see we have no chance. So, 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 so let's do it. The vaccine won't help us go the to the test, of course. The vaccine will help <laughs> us, of course. It will make things you know, more manageable. Surveillance, people could look back in 100 years and identify the coronavirus epidemic as the moment when a new regime of surveillance took over, especially surveillance under the skin, which I think is maybe the most important development of the 21st century, is this ability to hack human beings, to go under the skin, collect biometric data, analyze it and understand people better than they understand themselves. This. I believe is maybe the most important event of the 21st century. We are probably one of the last generations of Homo sapiens because in the coming generations, we will learn how to engineer bodies and brains and minds. Now, how exactly will the future masters of the planet look like? This will be decided by the people who own the data. Now, why is data so important. It's important because we've reached the point when we can hack not just computers, we can hack human beings and other organisms. Now, what do you need in order to hack a human being? You need two things. You need a lot of computing power and you need a lot of data especially biometric data. By hacking organisms, elites may gain the power to re-engineer the future of life itself. Because once you can hack something, you can usually also engineer it. Natural selection is replaced by intelligent design. The era of inorganic life is now beginning. In the coming decades, AI and biotechnology will give us godlike abilities to re-engineer life and even to create completely new life forms. We are about to enter a new era of inorganic life shaped by intelligent design. Our intelligent design. I try to convince people to slow down, slow down AI, to regulate AI. This was futile. I tried for years, nobody listened. No one. Maybe they will. So far they haven't. Okay. Fair enough. I agree with all that. But then why, having said that, repeatedly, as you can see, does he start a company called Neuralink, which is there to develop ways of connecting computers to the human brain? AI, in other words, to the human brain. What? Sorry, Elon, I thought you said it could be the end of humanity. Why are you involved in a company that's doing it then? Microchips implanted in our brains and artificial intelligence much smarter than humans. Appearing on this week's edition of The Global Lane, the author of the book Dark Eon exposes the globalist agenda for the future. Joe Allen explains scientism. The techno elites believe that science and technology, not God, are the means to human salvation. Scientism, very basically, is the belief that scientific inquiry and discovery will answer all of the existential questions in human life. All those questions which religion seeks to satisfy, scientism uh, holds up material discovery as the, uh, the means of salvation, the means of transcendence. Transhumanism is an outgrowth of that. Transhumanism is the idea that 
technology will be the the instrument of that salvation, the instrument of that transcendence. So this is not uncommon knowledge, I think, in our era. It's, in fact, very obvious, especially in the wake of the pandemic. Well, you mentioned that Gnostics believed in Sophia, a feminine figure that had godlike features, the female twin of Jesus, they believed. So is it by accident that one of the best known robots of our time is named Sophia? Tell us more about that significance. So the robot Sophia addressed the UN yet again for their uh, sustainable development goals meeting. Uh, Sophia takes her name directly from the uh, Gnostic Aeon uh, Sophia. So um, the robot was created by Hanson Robotics. Uh, David Hanson, founder of Hanson Robotics, named Sophia after the character Sophia in Philip K. Dick's novel, Vallis. The novel Vallis has a Gnostic premise. The character Sophia is meant to uh, symbolize the Sophia of Gnosticism. And if you look at the statements from David Hansen, if you look at David Hansen's PhD dissertation, uh, and of course other figures in and around Hansen Robotics, it's without a doubt, there's, there's no denying it. Uh, they are seeking to create a sort of technological inversion of what the ancient Gnostics put forward. Well, Elon Musk has talked about implanting an AI microchip into our brain. Do you really see that happening? What would that mean for humanity? Uh, would it make us smarter, destroy us both? So Elon Musk, who uh, September 18th uh, discussed this with Benjamin Netanyahu and also a num uh, two other prestigious AI thinkers, uh, he foresees a potential future in which he said hundreds of millions or billions of people would be implanted with these in order to guide AI according to human will. And um, this is not something that will happen. Neuralink, his company, Musk's company, just got FDA approval. But uh, there are two other companies, BlackRock Neurotech, funded by Peter Thiel, and Synchron, uh, which is funded by both Jeff Bezos and Bill Gates. Both of these companies already have brain-computer interfaces implanted in human brains that allow them to interact with digital vice devices by way of artificial intelligence. This is already a reality. Well, what about the human soul here, Joe? Uh, while they may be smarter than most humans at this point, AI and robots lack a soul. And it sounds like uh, these creators are trying to play God or replace God. So what difference does all this make? In their conception, and this is a generalization, but it's one that holds true for the vast majority of the people, uh, transhumanists, futurists, accelerationists, long-termists, they, you pretty much universally see the human brain as the soul. The patterns of the human brain are what Christians would call the soul. They are almost entirely atheist. They see the, these systems as being the creation of godlike artificial intelligence, artificial general intelligence. In fact, Mo Gaudat himself uh, describes it explicitly in these terms. He believes that the programmers at Google are creating a God that never existed in his mind. They are playing yeah. with fire. Yeah, it's, it's big time. Yeah, trying to play God. So what do we do about it? Um, you know, at this point, uh, given that we're talking about the wealthiest man on earth, uh, the most powerful corporations on earth, the most powerful military on earth, and all of their competitors in China, India, and Israel, and Europe, uh, I think probably this is not the most optimistic, um, the brace yourself. Not much we can do. I mean, uh, I, I think on an individual level, there's plenty. And on a communal level, there's plenty. But I think there's going to be a lot of sacrifices for anybody who doesn't want to play along with this whole thing. Okay, the book is Dark Aeon, Transhumanism and the War Against Humanity. Joe Allen, thanks for providing us with your insights. We appreciate it. I'm very glad to. Thank you very much. Thank you for having me.
was breaking uh, breaking different codes and uh, and data systems and uh, doing data analysis against the the Soviet Union. After 9/11. They took one of the programs I would, had done, or the back end part of it, and started to use it to spy on everybody in this country. So and that, that was a program they created called Stellar Wind. That was the separate and compartmented from the regular activity that was ongoing because it was doing domestic spying. All the equipment was coming in, I knew something was happening, but then when my, the uh, contractors I had hired came and told me what, what, what they were doing, it was clear where all the saw hardware was going and what they were using it to do. It was simply a different input. Instead of being foreign, it was domestic input. Somebody told me that they can listen to what we're saying by my having this, even if it's turned off. Yes. Here's the, here's the real grand design. Every domain, think of a domain as an activity, uh, a specific type of activity, phone calls, or banking is another domain. So if you think of graphing each domain and then each graph then turning it in the third dimension, the, the trick now is to map through all the domains in that third dimension, pulling together all the attributes that any individual has in every domain so that now I can pull your entire life together from all those domains and map it out and show your entire life over time. Why should I be? I don't, because if what you're saying if it was possible, it would be revolutionary and people would have a vested interest in preventing that from happening. I'm too old. I'm too old. I'm not sure how many of you got a chance to hear uh, Keith Alexander yesterday, the head of the NSA, uh, talk about the NSA's activities. Bill, how do you reconcile, is there some way to reconcile General Alexander's statement that the NSA isn't keeping track of every American with the existence of a facility like the one in Utah? NSA's charter, and it was a legitimate one, was to do foreign intelligence, and I was with that all the way, and I did the best I could in that job. Unfortunately, they took those programs that I built and turned them on you and I'm, I'm sorry for that I didn't intend that but they did that so what you're describing really is hard to reconcile with the laws as the laws are generally understood by the lawyers who work with them uh, most people are familiar with the Webster's definition of intercept you said 18 has a different definition and that's uh, some earphones or actually read some text on a screen so you can pull in all the communications you want the acquisition isn't the search uh, the querying later on is the search. They can then keep it in their database and target after the fact by going back and conducting data mining searches afterward, in other words, to get the information that they couldn't target from the outset. And there is another real problem. Uh, <clears throat> unfortunately, the software will, once it takes in data, it will build profiles on everybody in that data. The purpose is to monitor, be able to monitor what people are doing. Build social networks for everybody. Uh, that then turns into the graph, and then you index all that data to that graph, which means you can pull out a community that that gives the, you the outline of the life of everybody in the community. And if you carry it over time from 2001 up, you have that 10 years worth of their life that you could lay out in a timeline that involves anybody in the country, even senators and House of Representatives, all of them. The dangers here are that we fall into something like a totalitarian state like East Germany. Came in guns drawn, you know, in my house. They didn't do that to the others, but they did it to me. I guess, I don't know, they thought I was probably the most dangerous of all, so I don't know. I don't know what was in their minds, okay. So, but they did that, and they, and they came in and pointed the gun at me when I, I was getting out of the shower at the time, so they pointed a the gun right at my old head, you know, said, hey. So... <laughs> I wasn't too upset. I just said, uh, "Yeah, suppose I could get a, I could get dressed here." <laughs> you know, tried to. They weren't intimidating me anyway. So, taught me something that will uh, intimidate, in, implicate somebody in a crime. That's what they asked me. So I told them what the crime was that I knew about, and that was that uh, uh, 
George Bush, Dick Cheney, Tennant, and Hayden conspired to subvert the Constitution, the constitutional process, and any number of laws, and here's how they did it, and I explained stellar wind on my back porch to all the FBI agents who weren't cleared. So they had a problem. Uh, I created a problem for them because they had a bunch of people now who weren't cleared for a very highly classified, only because it was domestic spying, by the way, was the reason it was highly classified. They, you know, they wanted to highly classify the extreme impeachable crimes that they were committing. As a democracy, we need to say, do we want our government doing this or not? And do we want our government to, to, to have this data or not? And if, if so, if we want them to have it, then what kind of controls? And they have to be a little bit more visible. It can't all be done in secret. You can't have secret interpretations of laws and, and run them in secret and not tell anybody. Or can't make up kill lists and not tell anybody what the criteria is for being a kill list. This is something the KGB, the Stasi, or the Gestapo would have loved to have had about their populations. So, I mean, you know, and just because we call ourselves a democracy, right, doesn't mean we, can, we will stay that way. That's the real danger. And we, the people, may have absolutely nothing to say about it. We haven't had anything to say so far. Okay, guys, thanks for watching. I hope you learned something. I hope you enjoyed the video. Hit the like button, comment down below, and I'll see you in the next video. Peace.